Okay, so uh, let's uh, start actually by talking a little bit more about why we are looking at alternative to sulfur. We've been using sulfur since um, decades and it works great. So why suddenly there is all these alternatives to sulfur that um, are popping up and creating interest. The first thing is that there is a big consumer demand. The consumer wants more and more um, allergen free, uh, vegan, and sulfur as a bad image, you have to write sulfur on the label. And also for organic wines uh, under the NOP, you can't add any sulfur. So there is first a big demand uh, on the market, but then there is also some technical aspect uh, of sulfur. There is sulfur is actually um, acting is a solvent. So it acts as an extractor, which sometimes can be good, but sometimes, and I'm thinking more on, you know, white and rosé, where you don't want too much uh, phenolic extraction, uh, sulfur will do this, will extract more of the skin compounds. Also, if we are talking about green characters, grapes that are not as ripe as we would like to, uh, sulfur will extract more of these compounds. Smoke uh, situation, sulfur will extract more of the compounds that are present in the skin. So finding an alternative to sulfur to limit extraction can be a good thing. Also, sulfur inactivates uh, thiamine, which is an essential vitamin for the yeast. Um, but sulfur in general, not only because of the thiamine, but in general, um, stress the yeast. So it is um, antiseptic. So it will inhibit the yeast at high level, bacteria too. Uh, but at low level, we might not see it because we are used to, but it does stress the yeast. Stressing the yeast means usually more um, H2S or other of aromas produced, aromas that are related to stress or precursors of, of, of aromas, especially creating reductive condition later on. But also it means um, producing more acetaldehyde or molecules that will combine sulfur. And molecule combining sulfur means you will have to add more sulfur later on. As an antiseptic, um, sulfur is creating a microbial vacuum. So it's actually going to kill a lot of microbes, but then some of them are very resistant. So you're actually destroying the natural equilibrium of the mi microbial flora and creating this vacuum that will uh, in a way, create some resistance within families of microbes and can make it harder to manage microbes. Then, as we all know, sulfur uh, bleach color. We all say it comes back, but we um, probably all realize that it doesn't all come back. Uh, the theory uh, doesn't always match um, the practical aspect, so it doesn't always come back. And in terms of aromas and mouthfeel, uh, sulfur can make the wine very closed on the nose and very hard on the palate. So because of all these technical aspects and the consumer demand, we are looking at alternative to sulfur. It's actually not the only technical aspect. There is also a reason. Another reason is that sulfur is not always efficient or effective. When we're talking sulfur, we are talking different type of sulfur. We have the bond sulfur, which is the sulfur bonded to all the molecules I told you before, acetaldehyde, but also um, those are compounds that the yeast can uh, produce during fermentation and with stress. Uh, this bond sulfur has no effect, antimicrobial effect, antioxidant or antioxidasic, it doesn't work. So if we look at the free sulfur, in the free sulfur, there is two forms. Only the molecular sulfur will have an antimicrobial effect. And it happened that the molecular sulfur depends on the pH. Nowadays, with the temperatures that are getting warmer and warmer and the situation, uh, we are seeing pHs that are higher and higher. Sulfur is becoming actually not even an option as an antimicrobial um, agent for high pH wine. Because basically, if you look at the graph, I'm going to go pretty quickly on this. but. As soon as you get above 3.6, but let's say 3.8, um, but 3.6, you need a free sulfur of about 50 to consider having an antimicrobial effect. At 3.8, you need a sulfur, free sulfur 
at 80 milligrams per liter, which is actually not considerable. So because of all this reason, we are all talking about alternatives to sulfur. It is a big topic these days, but there is actually way more reason than just a consumer demand. Finding alternative to sulfur uh, is not only about bioprotection. Sulfur is actually a very great tool in winemaking because it has an antimicrobial effect, antioxidant effect, antioxidasic effect, and an extraction effect. So there is many tools that exist now um, on the market on, in winemaking that are allowing you to replace sulfur by family of actions. Um, you can use tannins, you can use like glutathione as antioxidant, antioxidasic, you can use enzyme for extraction. And for antimicrobial, there is many options. One of them is bioprotection, which we will focus on today. Um, but ketosan can be an option. Lysozyme is an option. Lysozyme does mostly bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, though, so it's not as wide as sulfur. Ketosan will have a wider action, but it's way more effective on wine, and it's also um, way more cost effective um, on wine. So bioprotection is the best option we have for antimicrobial control on grapes as an alternative to sulfur. We talk a lot about bioprotection these days. So what is it? What is bioprotection? The concept of bioprotection is to introduce a neutral microorganism uh, to inhibit the unwanted microbial development. So we are mastering the colonization and we are inhibiting all the microbes we don't want by introducing a microbe that is neutral. So not every microbe can work, but you know there is plenty of candidates uh, in the wine. The requirement for these microbes to be a bioprotector um, is that, of course, it has a strong inhibition of the spoilage microorganism that were considered spoilage in wine. Um, no inhibition of the positive microorganism in wine, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then later on, no inhibition power that will last when we want the malolactic fermentation. So no strong inhibition of anococcus honey on the finished wine. Low or no fermentation capacity. We don't want it to compete with Saccharomyces cerevisiae since we don't want to inhibit Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So if it has less low fermentation capacity, it will not consume um, nutrients, will not compete with Saccharomyces on nutrients, but also will not produce um, side molecules related to fermentation, such as CO2 or uh, aromas. We want uh, fast colonization. We want to be quick. We want this to be happening in a few hours. Uh, that this microorganism needs to be resistant to extreme condition in juice phase or grape phase. Since we're talking about grapes here. No negative impact on wine, of course, uh, but also respect the wine profile. We are not the bioprotector is not here to change the wine profile, it's really here to do an antimicrobial effect, no change of wine profile, and easy to use. Okay, so that's the requirements. Um, within all the microbes that are available um, naturally on grapes, uh, La Motadier did a big selection. Um, we did a big study with uh, the Stellenbosch University in selecting the best microorganism we can find uh, to uh, answer all these requirements and be the best bioprotector we can offer uh, for uh, winemaking. We came out with Excellence B Nature. So Excellence B Nature is the La Motabier bioprotector, um, so bioprotection solution. It is a pure Mechnikovia pulcherima, so it's a non-saccharomyces yeast. We're going to call it MP. Uh, to make it a little bit more um, easy to pronounce and more understandable for everybody. So uh, the, we started with a pretty wide selection that were uh, isolated from grapes of Sauvignon Blanc. Actually, well, the, the final one has been isolated from grapes of Sauvignon Blanc in South Africa. Our requirements were strong antimicrobial effect as a bioprotector, strong dominance and fast implantation colonization of the juice. No or very low fermentation capacity. We didn't want it to produce CO2, so you can use it on, um, 
on juice, on whites and roses, and you can settle. You can use it on um, transportation of juice without having a problem of um, CO2 production, and you know, like problem of uh, gas production. Uh, we didn't want it to inhibit Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so you don't have to um, have problem with fermentation, but also you can go wild and native fermentation. No of flavor production, so low H2S, low VA, low ethyl acetate, and the excellence B nature is also puff negative. So when I talk puff negative, it's actually puff is a gene uh, that is called um, phenols of flavor. Some yeast can produce um, volatile phenols or precursors of volatile phenol than Brettanomyces can take and then produce volatile phenol and what we call bread, bread taint. Um, all our excellence yeast, no matter if it's B nature or the fermenting yeast, are puff negative. Uh, it is an important criteria for us. So B nature is puff negative. It resists to the juice condition, or grapes condition, very low temperature. So you can do cold soak or you can do cold stabulation, cold settling, but also a total sulfur or an addition of sulfur at a juice phase of 60 ppm and low pH around 3 pp three of pH uh, will still work with B nature. And it is an easy to use yeast. I'm gonna show you some more data on all these points and really like showing you results of um, trials that we did talking a little bit more about the application. And then I'm gonna leave um, the mic to um, an, the open space basically for all of you to comment, but Lynn and Kylie, um, will be sharing their experience. Overall, it is a great alternative to sulfur for microbial control on grapes. That's what we selected it for. Um, there is huge family of Melchnikovia pulcherima. It's as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. As you know, each yeast is different, but they are all Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The same concept with Melchnikovia pulcherima. There's many, they are not all the same. So we selected this one, the B nature, specifically for microbial control on grapes bioprotection. So let's look at the antimicrobial effect. How is Mechnikovia pulcherima having an antimicrobial effect? I told you it's not competing with Saccharomyces because it's not consuming the nutrients, at least it'll be nature. So if we look at uh, the Mechnikovia pulcherima cell, cell uh, Mechnikovia pulcherima or MP, will produce pulcherimic acid. Pulcherimic acid is gonna then be um, extracted from the cell, sent out in the uh, juice and combined with iron. It does combine with iron naturally, the iron that is present in your juice and this produce pulcherimin. So here you have two, actually you have three effects, two that are antimicrobial. One, we are um, privating, we are depleting the media of iron which uh, some, most of the non-saccharomyces actually need iron to survive and develop. So we are removing uh, iron from the media and we are producing pulcherimin, which is a toxin for the non-saccharomyces and some bacteria. Okay, so we are inhibiting the development of, of non-sac, such as Brettanomyces, but also others, Onsenia spora, Candida, will be inhibiting inhibited by the pulcherimin and by the depletion of iron. The second, the third effect here, or second effect here, is that by depleting or by reducing the concentration of iron, we actually are um, helping uh, the um, reducing the redox reaction and reducing oxidation speed. Okay, so as I told you, there is many on the market. So this is part of our um, isolation study. Uh, you can see we are looking at different strains of Mechnikovia pulcherima. And in um, this table, we are looking at a different, the effect of different Mechnikov MP strains on Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Ansenia spora uvarium, Brettanomyces candida. Okay. Um, when there is a minus, it means there is no inhibition. When there is a plus, there is a inhibition. When there is double plus, there is a strong inhibition. We selected the um, 48 uh, here in this, uh, the, the code 48. This is our B nature. 
And as you can see, there is no inhibition with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but a strong inhibition with Ancenia spora, Bretanomyces, and Candida. Candida and Ancenia spora, especially Ancenia spora, are really uh, the most common non-Saccharomyces yeast on grapes that will be responsible of VA, ethyl acetate, and uh, producing toxin for the yeast, and also depletion of nutrients. So we have a strong inhibition on all of this, which is not the case for every uh, MP strains. Another example, this is a field example. So we did some trials uh, in wineries, and this is a result that we can see. We are looking at a control. Um, with, we are looking at bacteria, acetic acid bacteria population in yellow, lactic acid bacteria population in green. You have the control that are the two first line here, first control, control two days after cold soak, okay, with just sulfur. Then the B nature, no sulfur and B nature added, and the B nature two days after cold soak. What you can see is uh, with just sulfur, two days after cold soak, we actually have more acetic acid bacteria and a little bit more lactic acid bacteria. So the sulfur pretty much bond with all the sugar that you add and is not efficient after two days of cold soak. It doesn't have this um, antimicrobial control anymore. While the B nature did manage to reduce the population, uh, especially of the acetic acid bacteria. And this is mostly due to the privation of iron, but also there is a cellular breathing um, of the B nature that will consume some of the dissolved oxygen that is there. So uh, we are depleting the nutrients of acetic acid bacteria. We are putting uh, the mast in um, an aerobic condition, which is not favorable for acetic acid bacteria. But B nature, after two day cold soak, allow to reduce the population of um, lactic and acetic acid bacteria. So not only on non-saccharomyces, but also on bacteria, there is an antioxidant effect that in this situation is greater than sulfur. Then we want to make sure it's implanting and colonizing the um, juice very quickly. So here we are looking at a trial that uh, you can see the plates. We have the initial mast that is full of little green spots. The green spots are colonies of Ancenia spora. I told you they are the most um, present in the juice and the grapes. So that's the one we found um, the most common. Then we put sulfur and we look 24 hours after sulfur. Sulfur is uh, acting as, um, is destroying, I would say, uh, some of the microflora. So you destroy the equilibrium, but not every strength is resistant. So you create this vacuum, microbiological vacuum, which gives more space to some other uh, strains. Ancenia spora is uh, resistant to sulfur. And as you can see, we still have some green spot and only this, which give them a lot of space to grow. The next one, uh, as you can see, the plate is with also the green spot, but a lot of little red spots. All the red spots are uh, Machnikovia pulcherima. So Machnikovia pulcherima produce uh, pulcherimic acid that bind with iron. Uh, that's why actually when you make a colony, it appears to be red. And here you can see that in 24 hours, we completely colonized um, the juice. So fast and good implantation is something we can check on our list. It has been done. And we overpopulate compared to the Ancenia spora to have a good to uh, not have more development of it. So B nature really took over the microflora here. Then we want to make sure there is no inhibition with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So for this, we actually uh, look at, you have two graphs here. The first one is uh, looking at uh, two different dosage of inoculation. Um, and we are looking at Saccharomyces cerevisiae on the top and Mechnikovia pulcherima at the bottom. You can see after about four to three days, actually Mechnikovia pulcherima is decreasing, the population is going down because Saccharomyces cerevisiae just took over, took the fermentation, and the B nature is not resistant to alcohol. That's why it doesn't ferment. It's uh, actually dying at 3% alcohol. So, but Saccharomyces has no problem to 
um, take over the population and ferment. And here uh, in blue, you have a fermentation with sulfur. In yellow, you have no sulfur, but denature. And as you can see, um, no difference in terms of fermentation uh, kinetics. No inhibition of saccharomyces cerevisiae. We look at the wine analysis, and we want to make sure we respect the wine profile and not produce any off aromas. So that's very important for us. Um, this is, again, a field trial, excellence B nature versus sulfur. We did it many times, and we always have the same result. And I um, would love for uh, Lynn and Kylie at the end of the presentation to talk also about the result they got. Um, but basically, what we always see uh, so excellence B nature with no sulfur versus sulfur addition. We always have a lower or very similar VA. We have less inhibitory fatty acids. As you can see in the graph here, um, we measure the inhibitory fatty acid concentration that has been produced during fermentation. So this is post-ferment. It's important to look at this because this inhibitory fatty acids uh, can uh, first bind with sulfur and to create more combining uh, molecules and uh, requiring more sulfur later on. But also it will uh, inhibit yeast, so make the finish of the completion of the fermentation more difficult. It will inhibit bacteria, so make the bacteria more difficult to um, go on with malolactic. And uh, if we're talking sparkling wine, uh, it will make more difficult the second fermentation in the bottle because there is more inhibitory fatty acids. On this graph, you can see that there is two in a pretty big concentration inhibitory fatty acids that actually are produced only in the condition of uh, sulfur, not with B nature, and these are deadly. They are very um, toxic for the yeast and the bacteria. So why we didn't produce them with B nature? In fact, uh, what happened is uh, we um, have a way less stress on the yeast when we don't use sulfur and we use B nature to um, really clean the media and let uh, saccharomyces take over. So another result is we have faster and cleaner fermentation. We do have lower acetaldehyde pretty much all the time. This is one result here where you can see the control post-fermentation as 24 milligram per liter of acetaldehyde, while the B nature doesn't have any. Uh, we have a lower combining rate due to less stress, less acetaldehyde, and less inhibitory fatty acids. We combine less. Here, we're looking at the TL35, which means how much sulfur do I have to bring to the wine to reach 35 milligram per liter of free sulfur? And in this situation, when you have sulfur, already you, you add sulfur before, so you start with a higher total, and then you have combining molecules. We always end up with a higher total, a higher TL35 compared to the B nature. Regarding the other analysis, such as alcohol, pH, TA, even total phenolics, there is no difference. Uh, we observe a better um, combined um, anthocyanin, so a better color. And just because there is no sulfur, so we are delay, delaying um, the sulfur action and we are having a better uh, combination of anthocyanin, but this is um, not in a very significant way. Then if we look at the aromatic analysis, uh, we also realize that this is on a Chenin Blanc on white uh, from Loire Valley, so white grapes. We're looking at the thiolic compounds. Here, uh, the B nature, um, as a little bit more tiles. So because we, our conclusion is that there is less stress uh, in the yeast, the yeast can actually produce more, has more time and is more comfortable in the environment. So can actually be um, converting more uh, thiolic compounds, expressing them more. And also there is this cellular breathing that is associated with consumption of oxygen and we are depleting some of the iron. So we are actually delaying the oxidation and having kind of an antioxidant effect. If we look at the um, reductive compounds and desirable uh, unwanted sulfide compounds, we also have less due to uh, less stress from the yeast. 
and um, we didn't bring as much, we didn't bring sulfur to start with. So the yeast produced less um, sulfur compounds that can be uh, unwanted now and want, unwanted later in the process. Then um, organoleptic profile. So um, we did a tasting, uh, a pretty a big tasting of completely official tasting that uh, first uh, starting with a triangular test, which we got 99% um, different, which is huge in a triangular test. So basically the two wines, sulfur or no sulfur and B nature were completely different. Most of the people found the difference. Then um, in terms of tasting, we always uh, have, uh, you have on your left side of the screen, you have uh, Chenin Blanc, the same of the aromas. On the right side of the screen, you have the Bordeaux um, trial. We always have wines that are cleaner, more balanced, rounder, with less unpleasant aroma and more complex. You can see that in the um, Loire Valley trial, we really like have more uh, mouthfeel and same aromatic intensity, but say better aromatic pleasure, how they call it. And then in the uh, CAB trial, we are actually also comparing with uh, no sulfur, no bioprotection, which is a light pink curve you see here, which is really in the middle. Um, so actually people prefer no sulfur at all uh, if, if, than sulfur for sure. And then they prefer the one with the bioprotection uh, compared to the no sulfur with nothing. So pretty good consensus on the uh, organoleptic profile impact. Now, I told you it's easy to use. Why did I talk about this? Uh, so because it is really easy to use, we made it this way. The concentration of uh, Melchnikovia pulcherima in the B nature is very high. And this Melchnikovia pulcherima is very, um, has a strong viability, strong resistance, which means you don't even need to rehydrate it. We, this is showing you some trials where we did the B nature. We look at the viability um, at different dosage and also rehydrated and not rehydrated one hour after, 24 hours after. And the H is for rehydrated and the NH is for not rehydrated. So just sprinkle on the grapes as a dry powder. And you can see that pretty much we have no difference, no significant difference, which means there is no need to rehydrate. The only reason we, you would, it's just a practical reason to make sure you can disperse and uh, have a good repartition of your B nature all around your grapes. But also, um, if you do choose to rehydrate, we, um, we found out that basically the best would be to be at a 86 Fahrenheit temperature, 30 Celsius, not too hot, basically, and um, in a chlorine-free water, and you can keep this water for four hours. So some people prepare a spray jar and they spray it on grapes as they are uh, harvesting or they spray it on grapes as the grapes are coming in the winery. But you can also spray it in your equipment to have an extra um, protection of all your equipment. And this will stay viable for four hours in the, in the water. It's adapted to juice conditions, so it's uh, it's adapted to low temperature. Uh, max temperature, we usually say 30 Celsius, so um, about 86 Fahrenheit. And the low temperature, we um, in the graph here, you can see that basically we see uh, a development of the population uh, even at uh, 2 Celsius, so it's about 35 um, Fahrenheit. So it's actually working good even in very, very cold temperature. Low pH below three and a total sulfur of 60 ppm will not inhibit the development of B nature. How to apply it? On equipment, you can you prepare a spray, spray all your equipment. Usually people sanitize it and then they spray um, this between each lot to just make sure whatever is gonna be there is the um, B nature and not another um, molecule, another uh, microorganism. Uh, on grapes, you can rehydrate and spray, or you can directly sprinkle 50 grams per ton. On juice, you can sprinkle in the juice pan or rehydrate and put it in the juice pan. And here we are talking 10 grams per hectoliter. When? 
at picking, you can layer it with grapes uh, as you pick. That's the optimal, that's the best case situation, but not everybody can do it. So sometimes we say, okay, if you can do it in the vineyard, just put it once your gondola or your beans um, are full and you put it on the top of it before you transport the grapes. Um, or even if you do press juice, you can put it inside before you transport the juice. This will protect you, especially if you have more than half an hour transportation time, it will be actually a great protection, reducing VA and with or without sulfur will help you. At grape reception, if you can't do it in the vineyard, as soon as they arrive, especially if they are waiting in line, if your bean are waiting before being processed to fill the press or just to be processed, just go on the top, sprinkle it or spray it. At cold soaking, after the steaming, if you uh, do process them right away and you don't want to have it in your steamer, you can layer it with grapes or you're filling your bean on your tank. And in the press pan, um, if we are talking white and rosé, you can put it on the bean before you fill the press, but you can also just put it in the press pan. It doesn't produce CO2, it's resistant to cold, so no problem to do um, cold cycling with it. Or um, stabulation, some people use it because they are doing rosé, but they are filling the tank um, in a few days. And so this will protect your tank uh, with cold temperature from uh, fermenting with non-saccharomyces and VA. As a summary, really, we selected B Nature to be a bioprotector and that's it. So we want to, it to be an efficient bioprotector. We are not here to uh, give you a non-saccharomyces that will create aromas or mouthfeel or lower alcohol. That's not our approach here with the B Nature. The B Nature is really here to uh, protect the juice the grapes, the environment to have um, lower VA, lower SO2, lower combining SO2, and actually less stress for the yeast. So better cleaner fermentation, better aromatic expression, and just a, a better wine uh, overall at the end. No emission of saccharomyces, so you can go with wild fermentation, no of aromas produced, and actually less than if you use sulfur. We really respect the wine profile and it is very easy to use. Um, 50 grams per ton, you sprinkle it on the grapes. Uh, 10 grams per hectolitre, you put it in the juice and you can spray it. The spray bottle will last four hours. Okay, so this, uh, and you can use it for every type of wine. Um, so this uh, here uh, are all the different contacts uh, and link that you can find more information uh, in our library, in our webinars, and also on our shop, uh, so BVNA North America. I want to thank you for your attention. And now I actually would love uh, for, um, I know there is um, Kylie uh, from Two Oaks Vineyard and Lynn from uh, Napa Valley, um, Napa Wine Company that uh, used the Be Nature and were willing to share it. So I'm gonna invite them to, um, to be part of the panelists and allow to talk if they are connected and they um, want to share any of their experience with the B Nature. So Lynn, if you are um, with us, um, thank you very much for being here, but please uh, feel free to share all your experience with everyone. Okay, sure. And, uh, Hi. Hi, Lynn. Hi, can you hear? Yes. Okay. The picture is not working. All right, um, I'll start it out. I started using the B, uh, B Nature in vintage 2020. Before that, my fruits come in with high bricks. Of course, you know, that's asking for problem. And uh, at the end, I end, I end up with um, stock fermentation. It usually involves a lactobacillus and a VA start creeping up. Malic finish before the uh, primary fermentation, they're causing a lot of problems. So I start using that. And uh, <clears throat> that year, especially, I make a Zinfandel. That's another problem with the Zinfandel, where it was high bricks and high alcohol. Actually, they finished without rebuilding up a, a must at the end. 
So that was good. And it's a 2021, I use it more. And I reduced the initial sofa edition at the hopper. I used to use, add it like um, 55 ppm. I went down to the 30, 35 ppm. That was last year. And last year, all my fermentation finished without much struggle. And this year, we are supposed to make, starting this year, 22, we were supposed to make all our wine organic. So SO2 be a, addition of SO2 be the first uh, initial concern. We can't use so much. So I'm gonna really rely on this this year. Probably I will add a maximum amount per ton. And the way I add is, I usually add it to, after the fruit is sorted and they sit in the bin before they go into the tank, I do, uh, rehydrate because that would be easier to handle and uh, sprinkle over the berries and that would travel down to the bottom easier than the dry form. That's what I believe. And after that going to the tank, I do have a uh, two days of cold soak around 60 degrees. So I believe this the P MP would work on it for a couple of days before this hit with a Saccharomyces, then the, removing all the unwanted uh, ba ba microbes. And I'm gonna add a sulfur and start with all those uh, <clears throat> La Mata Viet <laughs> nutrients and so forth. And I'll sit this year for full, I probably not adding any sulfur at the hoppers at all. At the beginning, I'll try that. And then if the, I believe we'll, work fine and I'll let you know what happened this year. But that's a challenge for me that I'm, I'll probably pay more attention this year for the each lot. Let's see, take a lot of more uh, data together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll, I'll probably look for the lactobacillus at the end. And, you know, usually I look under the scope when it's uh, must having a struggle problem. Now look at it, oh, lactobacillus again. And that will produce BAs and also the Balactobacillus uh, use uh, um, produce um, bioamines, kind of uh, not positive, negative real aftertaste. So I, if I could remove all those, and that would improve the quality of the wine as well. Okay, great thing. Mm -hmm. That's about it. If you have any question when I add, how I add it or when I add it, let me know but I will add it at the hopper or into the bin after they get sorted and two days of cold soak. Okay, that's Thank about you, it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any, like, please feel free to write your question in the chat and the q and I'm gonna accumulate <clears throat> all the questions and then ask them um, after. Um, but this is great, Lynn. I mean, I'm, it, it's, it's really, um, well, it, it's great to hear that uh, basically, thanks to the, the be nature, you managed to have a better protection and completely avoid uh, doing a restart. So it's a big, um, I think it's, it's a huge um, point uh, for the, you know, to prove the microbiological control. Um, Kylie, I saw you are here as well. Um, so Kylie, you did, uh, you went full on, I think with no sulfur, um, actually, uh, if I remember well, but I will let you uh, share your experience. So Kylie is in two Oaks Vineyard in um, Oregon. And, um, and yeah, just uh, go on, share, um, share everything you can with everyone. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, that's correct. We don't use any inoculated yeast here. Um, we're really striving for site expression. Uh, so um, we ran our first trial with uh, the Bee Nature in 2019, uh, and it was just on one uh, fermenter um, of uh, Malbec. Um, and we were uh, very happy with the results. Um, then in 2020, did a pretty extensive trial with uh, Malbec, Tempranillo, Sauvignon Blanc, and Viognier. Uh, again, very pleased with the results. Um, uh, so um, normal winemaking practice here is uh, no SO2 added, 
uh, until um, the wines are through primary or through ML. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're, we're all, um, you know, wild yeast. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, very, very focused on site expression. Um, where I've really been uh, pleased with the, uh, the excellence bio nature is, um, you know, we add it on um, reds in the fermenter after processing. Um, early in the season, especially important. Uh, then uh, on whites, usually in the press pan, uh, sometimes in the tank, it just depends on how busy we are and what we've got going on. Uh, but I try to get it into the whites and the rosé in the press pan. Uh, and then later in the season, uh, I, don't, I don't worry about it so much later in the season. Uh, usually um, I notice that um, there's a certain kind of aromatic quality that starts coming off the red fruit um, with, the, uh, with the bio nature. And um, we sort of get the, the population established early in the year and they don't have to really worry about it so much. Um, late in the season. But one thing I do do late in the year when we have more fruit coming in than we can process in the day during the day, uh, we'll sprinkle the bio nature on the fruit uh, in the cold room uh, that we're not unable to process and then process that fruit the next day. Um, my experiment in uh, 19 and 20 involved um, the, you know, the experimental lot plus controls on all of the great, all of the varieties that we were testing it on. Uh, and it included all of the normal lab analysis. So um, pH, TA, VA, um, malic acid, um, alcohol, uh, as well as yams, both before um, with the bio nature at a couple of different points. Because uh, my big concern with it was putting this um, non-sec yeast in what was that I was gonna see some kind of drop in, uh, in my yams uh, prior to fermentation. And I did not notice anything at all. We did not see any significant differences uh, with anything. So I was very pleased to see that there really was no impact on yeast assimilable nitrogen by using the bio, uh, the, the bio nature. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that kind of covers it. You know, we're, we're focused, like I said, on site expression and elegance. So I don't typically have fruit come in that's more than 24 bricks. Um, uh, but we do tend to come in a little bit higher pH and a little, little bit lower acid than what you might expect for Oregon. So it's not unusual for us to have pHs in the 3.7 to 3.9 range, uh, especially in Tempranillo. Uh, and then acids usually in the 4.5 to 6 range, maybe 6.5, uh, depending on things. Uh, and we've seen really nice implantation, uh, really, you know, just a, a, it's been a, a really a home run product for us. Uh, and the ease of use cannot be stressed enough. I mean, it is so simple. It does not, you know, I don't rehydrate it at all. Uh, when we put it on the red ferments, um, we'll sprinkle it over the top and stir it in a little bit and then go in with our dry ice and our other um, oxidative controls on, on the cap. Um, and it's really, it is really that simple. When we sprinkle it into the press pan, literally it's sprinkling it into the press pan. There's no rehydration required, nothing at all. Um, it's super easy to use. I've uh, been very happy with it and uh, we'll, we're planning on continuing to, to use it. Thank you, Kaylee. I actually do have one question um, for you and then I'm gonna, I see there is questions for uh, both of you coming. Um, when you put it in the white and rosé, did you settle? Did you do any cold settling and was this completely fine? Yeah, we cold settle um, and usually it depends on what the program is uh, for the barrel fermented whites. Uh, we usually settle about 12 to 14 hours and then go to the barrel with relatively high solids uh, for the tank fermented whites. Um, it's usually 24 to 48 hours and, and closer to 48 hours of settling time. Uh, and then we'll rack pretty clean uh, and, and don't, you know, haven't seen any issues with, uh, with it. You know, we haven't had, you know, um, issues that I would attribute to the use of the bio nature as far as fermentation kinetics or fermentations finishing or, uh, or any, anything like that. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna start to read. Uh, so I'm gonna go with the question. There is a question from Cameron to Lynn. Um, so Lynn, you, you, so you use the bio nature with uh, higher bricks, uh, are you, which type of bricks are you talking? Is it about 28 or more? And then um, 
Yeah, because Cameron is also having um, to harvest sometimes very late and he is curious to know if anybody has an experience with uh, later harvest with more deteriorated uh, fruits and how um, you to use by your nature. Yeah. 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 So especially with Zinfandel, as you know, the fruit does not ripen evenly on one grape seed of cluster two. And I just have to wait and keep waiting. And of course, I end up having some raisins. That would release a lot of sugars in the, during the cold soak, also during the fermentation, end up with a higher bricks than the one I picked. So, so B nature would, you know, and then they'll also they would come up with lots, obviously some rods, sour rods and the mold coming in. We try to uh, sort them out as much as we can, but we weren't able to do that. So B nature would come in handy to take care of those in the tank. And I see that. I could see the smoother fermentation and I'm seeing less BA production. That's a positive, very positive. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in regard to this question, mm -hmm. I, so for the deterioration, de, so any fruits that has, um, you know, botrytis or mold or audium or mildew, you know, any type of damage, in fact, uh, we saw, so if the damage is very high, and especially if it's like bird damage that start to have like VA already in the fruit, um, we are increasing the dosage uh, from 50 grams, we we'll go to 60 uh, grams per ton. Uh, but we saw really a, a better effect of the B nature, even with sulfur, than if we don't put the B nature. So I would um, I would agree with Lynn that it, it did work also in um, very complex situation. Uh, so one question: uh, Any conflict when using bentonite fining on uh, white juice? So. We'll answer, uh, Martin, um, no, there is not because the bentonite will not bind with the B nature. But I'm also gonna leave, um, Kylie, did you use any fining agent uh, during your cold settling? And did you see any interaction when you um, used on white and rosé? We, we don't typically use any um, additive. Uh, I usually will just use some settling enzyme on the whites uh, and haven't had you know, haven't noticed any issue with it at all. Um, I don't um, I, I don't like to find um, before uh, during the cold settling process because um, I don't I don't want to really take a chance on stripping anything at all out of the wine until until after fermentation. So yeah, I, I don't like to I don't like to bit might find uh, the juice at that phase. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but if you do, there is no interaction. Uh, one question. So I see Thomas um, as a question, but also um, as an experience with the B nature. So I'm going to start with a question. Uh, any issue using B nature uh, when starting fermentation with a non sac yeast, then finishing with a saccharomyces yeast? That would be addition of three different yeast. So, yeah, uh, Tom, it's going to be. Um, so Depending which other non-sac yeast you use, uh, the B nature might inhibit it because the goal of uh, B nature is to inhibit the development of non-sac. So uh, we know Ancenia spora, we know Candida uh, will be inhibited. If we are talking Torula spora, Torula spora will not inhibit uh, the B nature, but Torula spora ferments. So you will then after like 3% alcohol, the B nature will not be active anymore. So it's really, the B nature is really here for the bioprotection at the beginning of the uh, process. And um, yeah, it would be three uh, yeast to add, but for three different goals. One is the B nature for your bioprotection. One is your non-sac for, I, I don't know which reason uh, you use it, but I would imagine aromas or mouthfeel. And then, then you have your saccharomyces to uh, finish and to complete the fermentation. And in the same time, um, I wanted to uh, share um, Tom's comment. Um, so Tom say he's starting to use uh, Excellence B Nature on all the whites and rosé last year in place of sulfur uh, during grape processing. And he was 
very happy with the result. Uh, Tom, uh, if you want to tell us a little bit more about how you used it, uh, let me find you in the panel and so I can maybe um, manage to uh, unlock your mic. And, um, and if, if, you, if you want to um, share your experience, please feel free to take the mic uh, and share it with everyone. I'm gonna let you see if you can or not while I keep reading and please just interfere as soon as you can, uh, if you are here or if you can uh, come in. Then we have um, James uh, or Jim from uh, Auburn Winery that is uh, telling us that he successfully used the Binature nature um, in 2019 with 50% uh, of the sulfur dose. Um, in 2020, they went with uh, only the B nature and they only had, they had few um, that stuck, but like no sulfur at all. Uh, so knowing that 2020 was a complicated year in uh, Napa Valley, I find it a very successful result. Um, it, that's what he is actually um, saying. So it could have been due to the smoke contamination. Don't really know about that. Uh, I don't think the smoke and the a B nature can be um, are related, um, but actually we don't have any data on this. So it's actually a very good question to open. And then, um, and this year you will go with 50% SO2 dose uh, again, as you are very happy with the 2019 results. And I, um, if I remember well, you used it mostly on red. Same thing, uh, Jim, if you are in the panel and you want to um, share your experience, I'm gonna unlock your mic too. Uh, so do we have Tom? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I'm here now. Yes, please go ahead, Jim. So uh, we, we're actually Auburn James, not Auburn. And, uh, uh, and we're based in St. Helena, so we were right in the middle of the fires in 2020, which was uh, very unfortunate. The, the application in 2019, um, I, I was brand new to this concept at that time and a little nervous. So uh, we decided to go with the 50% dose of KMBS into, uh, at Crush, as we have done 50% uh, of what we would normally use. And, and it worked great. We, we added B Nature just as a dry product. We didn't rehydrate it or anything. Um, the, the way I add it is to sprinkle it into, we, we do a whole berry yeast stem and, uh, and then uh, use a peristaltic pump to move those berries to wherever they're gonna go to uh, for, for our larger ones, uh, our larger uh, crushes. And so we add it in the peristaltic pump. So it just gets very naturally mixed in with the, uh, the berries as they go through. And yeah, it, it worked great. We were really happy with 2019. I, I can't explain what happened in 2020. We didn't use Bee Nature in all of our, um, in all of our uh, ferments because we do a little bit of custom crush work and some customers wanted to do it and some didn't. And we had, uh, we had both B nature and non B nature ferments that got stuck that year. And the only thing we can come up with is there was just something weird going on because of the, uh, the, the level of contamination in the area. And, um, you know, we, we have no explanation for it other than 2020 made us nervous. So we're, we're going to use the 50% uh, going forward until we get a little bit more comfortable to go to 100%. But, the information I've got today makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. I just, um, just not ready to make that jump just yet. Too much money involved here. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, I will. I will probably. Uh, we can uh, talk more about what happened in twenty twenty to uh, figure out uh, the reason. I'm interested to understand too. It was a challenging vintage, as everybody knows. Uh, so there is one more question that I see from Zoran. Um, is there any inhibition against uh, lactic acid bacteria? So Zoran, yes, on uh, the grapes. 
So the B nature will inhibit the development of lactic acid bacteria. And I think that's what um, Lynn was sharing too, like looking at lactobacillus and not having a stack fermentation by using B nature is really the proof that we did inhibit the development from the beginning before they get too much uh, population. We inhibit the development of lactic acid bacteria and we saw it in the graph too, we can reduce the population during cold soak. This said, this effect doesn't last because as soon as uh, Saccharomyces is taking over and fermenting, the population of uh, Mechnikovia pulcherima or B nature is gonna drop with uh, the toxin produced too. So this is gonna settle and we know um, we have no problem at all to conduct the malolactic fermentation even in the co-inoculation. So we know that after a few days uh, of fermentation, there is no more effect of the B nature. The idea of the bioprotection is really to control the population early on before they actually start to develop. And so there will never be a problem uh, later in the wine. I don't know if anybody um, has a comment. If Lynn, you have a comment on the on the bacteria, uh, but also Kylie or Jim, if you, did you see anything regarding malolactic fermentation um, by using the denature? I haven't noticed any issue with um, lactic acid bacteria compatibility uh, in using the BioNature. Um, you know, we. I don't typically have a lot of um, stuck primary fermentations, but we do usually see some lagging malics. Um, but uh, it's never been anything that I could attribute in the years that we trialed um, the the bio nature. Uh, I didn't have any issues that I could attribute solely to uh, the use of that product versus my controls. Perfect. Thank you. Um... And, and Eglantine, I would add, um, I like to co-inoculate. So I usually, um, I don't inoculate for primary, uh, but I usually inoculate for malic uh, somewhere in the nature, in the range of 10 to 14 bricks um, in the fermenter when it's still warm and then finish both primary and malic in barrel. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't noticed any issues with compatibility at all. Perfect, so yeah, so I did, um... I'm, I'm glad to hear what we um, what we see. Uh, you know, the, you know, some the, the theory and the application is actually uh, matching. Um, and to, Tom uh, is uh, telling us that he did use it on the Chardonnay, and the Chardonnay went through malolactic with no issues, also. So it's a very uh, similar comment. Yeah, we we uh, we do co-inoculate also, but normally the lower brick somewhere around three, three to five. And uh, we have not seen any issues at all uh, due, due to using, um, using B nature. It, it's not, not been, not had any consequence as far as MLF is concerned. I have one more question um, from Cameron. So harvesting uh, very late, I found, uh, I have found it till, sorry. Um, so when Cameron is harvesting very late, he found some methyl acetate uh, that come in every lot during the lag phase. Uh, and now that he used B-Nature, he doesn't have ethyl acetate. Uh, so he is um, very happy about the B-Nature. Um, and he's asking if anybody in uh, the participants used it in sparkling wine. Uh, so I, I have... Let me see if I see any, like, please, if you did use it in sparkling wine, uh, share your comment. I know um, I know that some people used it in sparkling wine and um, as an alternative to sulfur, as you know, sulfur is a very um, tight topic in sparkling wine because we need to do the second fermentation. And um, very happily, pretty much the same than in steel wine, you know, you can allow, uh, so from uh, the time somebody uh, answers the question, I will answer from what I saw uh, working with other wineries, uh, that usually the uh, B nature is added to the juice at uh, pressing or on the grapes during pressing. 
and this allow to not put as much sulfur on the grapes and you really manage to reduce your sulfur of at least the total sulfur is reduced of a good uh, 20 to 30 ppm which is a big thing in sparkling wine um, just very happily used So Tom said he didn't use it on the sparkling wine base, uh, but he will this year. Yeah, it's pretty much the same result. Uh, what we see is less. Um, we saw, we saw. Uh, I would say not in all the trials, but I did see a little bit less reduction. Uh, then I didn't have any um, experience in the sparkling that struggled with the second fermentation, so I can't tell you comparing. Uh, but the second fermentation went very fine. So we leave a little bit more time for everybody to ask more questions, but I really would like to thank you everyone for the participation, especially Lynn, Kaylee, uh, Jim and Tom. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with everyone. Uh, please.